So go for it. All right, thanks. So, uh, um, so here's the thing I'm going to do. So, so what's 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 a basic thing in mirror symmetry? I start with some Calabi-Yau. It likes to be a log Calabi-Yau today, um, and you know they're supposed to come in these mirror pairs. And even if you don't know anything about it, you might wonder. Um, you know, so given given you given this Calabi-Yau, how do I get the mirror? How do I get mirror? So, well, what's the baby case of this? What's the baby case? Baby case of this is if U is a torus. That's why the, the, in the log thing, there's a truly baby version. So I can take U to be an algebraic torus, TM, by which I mean M tensored C star, where M is the, is the co-character lattice, co-characters. So what does that mean? If you, hopefully lots of you uh, do a little torque geometry, that means if you take the associated vector space, that's where you draw the fan, where you draw a fan for this for this guy. And what's the mirror in this case? In this case, the, the mirror, you can just say, right, say what it is by saying what its functions are. It's the spectrum of the group ring of M. So, so this is the thing we want to generalize. So this is what we want to, want to generalize. So first of all, so how do we generalize M? So that's the, the lattice of co-characters. So we have M, how to generalize this to some arbitrary calabi -yau. And the first thing is, well, thinking of them as co-characters, that means as uh, uh, one parameter subgroups of the torus, that's not useful for this. But if you have an M in here, the, th the way you should think about it, M in there, it gives you a divisor. I'll say a divisor at infinity. It's a divisor in a toric variety. Um, and it, because I have a divisor, I can I get from that evaluation on the generic point of, of, of the scheme. I could write down what it is, but I, I don't think I will, what the evaluation is, because it won't t tell you much. But just to remind you what I mean by the divisor, you know, here's, here's the M or the vector space given by M. Here's the zero point. I've got a little point M, and I'm saying if you choose one point in the co-character lattice, you get a, un a, a unique boundary divisor, because what you do is you, something you probably don't normally do is think about the toric variety given by the fan, which has just got a single ray. So just have one ray. So what's the toric variety given by a fan with just one ray? The ray living in a much larger lattice. You know, um, if you just take, if you take a one dimensional fan with one ray, of course you get A1, but, but not if this is a ray in a, in, a, in a large lattice, then the toric variety given by this ray, what is it? Well, it's, it's, got, it's got one boundary divisor. So it's U union, a single divisor, I'll call it DM. So that's what the thing is. Um, so that the, uh, um, that, so, so that, and then associated to DM, I have a, I have a valuation, say, or D um, on, on the function fields, let's say minus zero, which just, you know, just tells you the order of zero or pole of a function along this divisor. Okay, so let's let's so that's what the so that's the basis. Notice what what how did that work? That was flipping back here. That was the basis of functions. That's M. Um, that's the basis of functions on the mirror. So we're going to try to build the mirror in general in, in basically the same way. So uh, uh, so so I'm still in the process of generalizing M. How am I going to do it? Well, now we're going to take a little aside here into Berkovich geometry. So I'm going to take K to be a uh, uh, K is going to be a field, and I'm going to have a evaluation on it. A real valuation. Um, so it's a real valuation, which is non-Archimedean. A non-Archimedean valuation. What does that mean? Well, I'll just write it an equivalent equivalent bit of information. Instead of taking this function, is you take um, takes its, its exponential. So take exp, just exponentiate actually minus v. That's a function now from k into r greater than or equal to zero, and people call that the norm. It's the norm of v. It's the same information as v. Um, and non-Archimedean means that the norm satisfies the strong triangle inequality. So the norm of x plus y is less than or equal to the max. Norm x, norm y. So I have a field with this kind of valuation. What are some examples? I could take a discrete valuation. For example, one of the, the valuation given by a divisor on the field of fractions that I had before uh, above. Discrete valuation, or actually, amazingly, you get an awful lot of money out of the trivial valuation. Uh, just take the trivial valuation. 
So that just means that V is a, as a function on K minus zero is just identically zero or the norm of X is just identically one unless X, if X is not zero, if X is zero, then it has norm zero. So that's the, the trivial evaluation. Okay, and now suppose I have, a, um, suppose I've got a scheme X over K, so it's a scheme. And now I'm gonna put down an innocuous looking definition. One of these things that, uh, I don't know what you do late at night, but uh, I would have been very happy to have come up with this definition. So X analy the analytification of X, what is it? It's just pairs of uh, X and W where X is a scheme point of X. So I've got a point in the scheme, then I have a residue field K of X. And I give, a, I give myself a evaluation on that, which extends the given valuation V on K. Okay, so just pairs, give yourself a point, and then you, on the residue field, you extend the valuation. Uh, um, so this is a, 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 a this is the de definition of the analytification. Um, and let me remark right away that this is not just a set. First of all, it's a topological space. How is it a topological space? Uh, what's the topology? Well, first of all, there's a map from X analytic, let's just call it big F, to X, just forget. Just forget the, just forget the, the forget W, forget the valuation. Just, you got a map like this. I want this to be continuous. And then, and then you just check from the definition. If I take an open set, say U in, in X, then, then the inverse image of U is just the analytification of u. Um, and then if I have a function on u, a regular function, I get a map from u analytification to r, which is just, what do you do? You just take, take the norm. So take, you just take, you send uh, uh, xw goes to, you take f at x and take its norm, the w point. So, that, so it's actually to r greater than or equal to zero. So I want all these to be continuous. And the weakest topology that does all this stuff, that's the topology. Um, it's, um, let, let me say that it's, maybe I'll, I'll say a, more, a word about the topology in, in a second, but before I even mention the topology, it's much more than this. It's also X is actually, X analytic is a ring space. It has a sheaf of uh, um, analytic functions on it. So it has, it has a sheaf of analytic functions functions, analytic functions. I won't tell you what they are because you won't really need it so much. I hardly ever think of them. Um, what I mostly think about is the following, that if I, that, that, so, and this is the basic example of what's called a, a, a Berkovich K-analytic space, analytic space. I guess it wouldn't be a, yeah. So here's a dumb question. So you, so with the analytification, it's, uh, so you have the points and you have all the, you have lots, you might have all sorts of different choices of how to explain. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. In fact, our, the, the biggest set that we're gonna look at, you'll see, will all be valuations on the generic point. So yeah, it's, it's, this is the fibers are big of this thing. Good, Ravi. So X goes to uh, um, the, the procedure though, X, so X goes to X analytic, meaning you're taking a scheme into one of these K analytic spaces. This is a functor, of course. Um, and the, the reason I never think about this very much is we have, there's a Gaga principle. This is, if you, if you restrict to projective schemes, it's just an equivalence. It's a full, whatever you call it, a full embedding. The maps are exactly the same on both sides. So they're just basically the same information. Just like if you've ever heard of, I'm sure you have, the complex analytification. If you have a variety over C, let's say a, a smooth variety over C, then it's also a complex manifold. Um, and if it's projective, you don't gain any new maps by, by thinking of analytic maps. Same so thing is true here. So Sean, this is a, so the thing you've defined, you, it's now completely well-defined as this ring space. It, what have you defined, is this guy that Berkovich, is this, have you just, yeah, the great thing is like, we don't need to know about Berkovich spaces. You just define everything from scratch. That's right, yeah. This yeah. About, and, and quite, and, it, and, it, and I actually live in this world. I mean, I, I work with Tony Yu. This is all joint work with Tony Yu. He's a stud in, in this subject. I am definitely not, but I have managed to contribute to the problem without knowing really anything about these things. You know, right. just everything that ought to be true. I just, you know, crack a book. Yep, true. And, and, and is this um, an example just for the for the non? Yeah, yeah, well, of course. This, this, this is a this is a non. Uh, did you just define a kind of Berkovich space? Is this a Berkovich analytification? I just gave you the Ber Berkovich analytification. Yes. Um, okay. But, uh, okay. Yes. Yes. Um, right. Okay. Uh, uh, and let me let me say a little bit about the topology. I'll, I'll get to some examples too. What, but I want to say it as a nice topology. Well, we just. Um, uh, let me just note that there, that xk, the k points of x, and in fact, even k, the algebraic closure points of x, just canonically live in x analytic, because what does that mean? That x is in here just means that, of course, that k of x is equal to k. And so I can just take w 
equal to V. In fact, I don't have a choice. So, so the rational points live inside of there. Um, and uh, um, this thing has some nuts topology on it because it has this, it has this uh, strong, uh, you know, it has a, it, the norm on here is, is this ridiculous thing. It's like the QP. It's like a, the, the, the QP norm. This thing is totally disconnected. Disconnected. This thing, the analytification is path connected. At least if X is connected as a scheme, it's, it's path connected, locally compact Hausdorff space. Dorf space. This really is a nice topology. Um, let me give you an example. So really the only example I think that if you can fully understand is let's take X to be P1. Um, then, then the analytification is what is a, is a tree. It's actually a tree. It's what's called an R tree. R tree, um, it, you know, it, it's a tree, but the valence at vertices can be infinite. It looks like the, uh, it's quite closely related to the, um, the building for PGL2. Um, but, but in particular, the, the, the rational points, let's say K equals K bar, just so I don't have to keep putting the bar. XK, these, these are leaves of the tree, leaves. And now, I, and now I can kind of draw quite a lot. So let's say I take a bunch of points, rational points, P1 up to PM inside of P1 here. And then I'm gonna, so those, are, those give me points in the analytification. I mean, I've got some points, they're leaves. This is a tree. So in a tree, if you've got a bunch of points, you can take its convex hull. Take the smallest tree that can, subtree that contains all those points and you get a very cool thing. So this is living inside of X analytification and this thing, so this is a, you know, this is a little graph with four points. This is an element of M0, four, M0 N bar, M0 N trop. I hope people have heard of the trop, if you've, if you've heard of the trop, uh, tropical curves in, in any sense, then you might like some of this talk. Otherwise you might not get a whole lot out of it. Um, this is the space of metrized graphs metrized graph. So what I'm saying is this tree that lives in there, this graph, it, it comes with a canonical metric is the point. And these links are infinite here, the, the parts that go off to more points, but this is a you know, finite length thing. Um, so that guy's sitting in there. Um, and now there's a retract. I mean, X, you know, this thing lives inside of X analytic. This is a tree. So there's a canonical map back, which is the retraction. Um, let me give an example of that. Let's say I take, for example, zero and infinity as, as K points. So then the tree is just a, just an interval, in, infinite interval, zero infinity, and I have a retraction. So I, I can't really draw X, you know, because it's this big tree retracting onto this interval and, and there's the valence is huge. But anyway, you've got a bunch of this, but it keeps going and going. You have this retraction. And now, um, how should you think of that retraction? That's a map from X analytic to zero infinity. Inside of here, we had XK and this, you can just check, this map is just literally the norm just the ordinary, you know, the, the norm on the K points. So this is, you think of this as the norm map. And in particular, if I look at, let's take a point on here, say zero D and look at the inverse image under retraction of zero D. Well, what's that? That's the set of points of norm is less than or equal to D. That's a disc. Um, and, the, and the whole X is, I can take sort of DD, let's say union D infinity. I mean, in other words, what I mean is take, you know, take the, this is just the inverse image of, of, of D to infinity. And in the Berkovich world, the disk, this is one of the reasons this is a really great thing for mirror symmetry. The disk is a perfectly good object, perfectly nice algebraic object. Of course, it's, you know, it's perfectly nice as an analytic, as, if you're doing ordinary complex analytics, it's perfectly fine. And in the Berkovich world, the disk is a basic example. So that's a nice thing. So, so anyway, the, this John, John, said, the small point is that this disk is a closed disk. So when you said the complex, it's a closed disk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the picture here. Conceptually, this is of course what it looks like. Conceptually, this is what I got. I, I, when I have this, when I choose this zero and infinity inside of P1, I canonically decompose P1 into two disks, two closed disks. Meaning, okay, just like in the picture. Okay, um, let's see. What's an O? So that's an example of something that I, that I think is really cool about the Berkovich world. I think of X analytic. It's got XK in it. That's algebraic geometry, but it's also got this metrized graph. That's tropical geometry. They both live inside of here at the same time. Um, let's give an ex a more radical example of that. Suppose I take now U, and, and now let's take K to be trivially valued, just for simplicity. The, the, everything I'm saying here works in general, but it would just take more words. Um, let's take U smooth, let's say, and, and let's take a, a let's say you, you sits in Y and this is an SNC compactification. Um, everything over K here. 
Um, and then let's let say, uh, and let's let the boundary be d. So d is y minus u. So this is some d, d1 plus plus dn. You know, maybe for example, I might have y might be p2 and d might be three lines. The standard toric boundary, for example, p2. That might be my picture. Then I want to form the dual. The du let, let's let sigma be the so-called dual fan. So what's the dual fan? Well, just it's just an abstract fan. It doesn't live in a vector space. It's just a union of cones. And it's k-dimensional cones, let's say r-dimensional cones are in bijection with co-dimension r strata of the of this strata of the of this compactification. Um, and the thing is that this, at least the underlying set of this uh, union of cones, a sort of cone complex, that lives canonically inside of U analytic. Um, let me describe how, how does that work. So, you know, what, what do we got? Um, so here's a, here's a here's a picture of uh, just going to draw a little bit of it inside of uh, U analytic. Well, so first of all, notice oh, I should have let me let, let me remark when k is trivially valued, then the analytification has a scaling. You just just scale just scale omega the the valuation just multiply it by the complex by your real number lambda. Because because it's trivial on the ground field, that still doesn't you know you're not doing anything on the ground field. The ground field is zero, so this is still in the analytification. So you always have a scaling. You also have a canonical point in this case, which is a canonical zero point, which is just you take the generic point of x. That's your that's your little point x, and just take the trivial valuation. And now each point. So here's my here's my uh, here's my boundary d for each of the irreducible components of d. Let's say d1, d2, d3. Say d1, for example. D1 has a, has a point in the analytification, namely the, the thing I mentioned before, the, the divisorial valuation. So you take the generic point with the valuation given by this divisor. That gives you a point, and now we have scaling, and we'll get a whole ray from that. So we just we just take, take multiples of this of this valuation. That gives me a ray, um, and then I have you know I have this for all three of them. And now the, the claim is that this also, you know, there's also a valuation, a canonical valuation, actually always on the generic point, um, associated to each of these cones, each of the cones as well. These real points also, you can interpolate, fill this whole thing in. For example, what are the integer points in here? There's lot, there's natural integer points in this dual complex. What are those integer points? Well, those are those are valuations, divisors, but they're divisors that live on blowups. Like if I, let's say here's D1 and here's D2, let's say I blow that point up. So then the picture would look like this. Then I would have gotten a new guy. That's, that's, that would have been the, this guy here. You wanna be careful. I don't wanna, I, I will call it D1 plus, I don't wanna call it D1 plus D2 because there is no addition in this space. There is in this cone, there's no addition in this space. You can't add the sum of two valuations is not a valuation. Um, so you can't take two boundary divisors and add them. These are irreducible divisors. You know, they're not. These are these aren't bay divisors. But anyway, that guy lives inside of there. And let me remark that if um, if this is a minimal compactification, if ky plus d is, is nef, for example, trivial, then then this underlying set, uh, the underlying set of sigma, is what's called the skeleton of U, and it depends only on U, not on the compactification, only on U. I should have mentioned back to my earlier example when I took P1. Um, and let's let, let's let in that case, let's let uh, um, C be, um, let's call that C bar. And inside of here, C, that was the comp, remember I took a bunch of points, P1 up to PM. So I had, uh, I had the, uh, my P1 here. Oh shit, excuse me. Um, uh, oh man, I just switched, oh gosh, uh, oh man. I just switched to a, I don't ever use this thing. I just switched to a different, I can just, it's all right. You guys won't be, it's all right. We'll just, we'll just wing it. I just switched to a different notebook and not the one I want. Um, can I get back to the other one? Actually, um, I don't know how to. John, this is making me sad because I want your notebook. I, I, like, I feel like the notes you had before, I want to. Yeah, no, yeah, well, we'll see what happens. I mean, I'm sure they're there somewhere, but anyway, I'll just keep going. I'll just have to keep clearing the page every time. It's just some old junk. So uh, anyway, let's go back to my example. So I said, you know, we had P1, before I started with P1, conceptual picture here of P1. So, so a couple of questions, Sean. One is, you said yeah. discussion of you depends only on you. 
uh, yeah, that's, that's up the homeomorphism. What do you mean by depends on? No, no, as a set, this this subset, I defined it in terms of the compactification, but yeah. but this set of this subset of the analytification is canonical to you. I can say what it roughly is. Uh, well, I'll say it in a second. Okay. okay. Um, let, uh, here, I wanted to also say that in the case that I first started with, where I where I had um, P one, and I took the, you know inside of P one, I had this canonical graph inside the analytification. That graph is also canonical. That graph, I, I call that, let's call that the skeleton of C. That's where C is P1 minus the points. That's also canonical. The, you know, the, the, if inside of living inside of um, the skeleton of C lives inside of C analytic, that means you have to throw away these points. Those live outside of C. But otherwise, that, that graph is, a, is a, these. A, what I'm saying is if you have P1 minus a bunch of points, that thing has a canonical skeleton inside of it. It has a canonical metrized graph just living inside of it. Um, that's, the, that's the thing. Um, so for example, uh, um, if, if ky plus d is trivial, that's, what, that, that, that's the same thing as saying u is log kalab yao. That's an example of this. And we call this, this is what the skeleton is. There's a canonical skeleton. And, and what is it? Well, what this means is that, that, that it's log kalab yao. That means that this thing comes with a canonical volume form. Uh, omega u. This is not the value. This looks like the same symbol I was using before for the valuation. This is completely different. This is its volume form. And what is the skeleton? Well, at least the integer points, that is the points of it that correspond to uh, integer multiples of divisorial valuations. These are the, div these are divisors, you know, on some compactification where omega has a pole. And you can similarly define the q points, and then you just take the closure of that. That's what the skeleton is. So we, so we have you, we have a bunch of questions now. So uh, go ahead. Why does the minimal compactification mean that k plus d is an f? Th that's the definition of minimal. So okay. let's so take that as the definition. By definition, great. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, let's see. Uh, right. Okay. So and let me just say, in general, what in general what happens then? I mean, I should have said this. So this, oh yeah, what's a basic example? Sorry, let's go back to our basic example. What about a torus? Then, the, of course, this sigma that I'm truing, this sigma is just is just the fan, the toric fan. You know, these are just this is just the, tor the ordinary toric fan living inside of. But in but in but in the Berkovich world, the fan lives inside the guy, and the same thing is true. Just like the underlying set of the fan, that was these that was this M that was MR, the you know the skeleton of TM. Should have said that's MR. It now different compactifications, different toric varieties break up this canonical set into different fans. Great. The underlying set, of course, it stays the same. Same thing happens in, in general. The, you know, every time I compactify U to some Y, I'll break up the skeleton into some cones. Um, they will vary, you know, from one compactification to the next. Okay. Um, let me give you another fun example of it because it will be relevant. Let's take M0N sitting inside of M0N bar. Well, the analytification of these spaces has exactly the same meaning. You know, I mean, you know, what, what's M0N bar analytic as a functorial meaning in the Berkovich world? It's, it's a Berkovich rational curve together with a bunch of rational points. That's not very deep at all because all the, all the Berkovich rational curves by Gaga are just analytifications of, of rational curves anyway. But still, it's a cool thing. And so it's a compactification. This is a minimal, minimal compactification. What's the skeleton of M0N then? So it's completely canonical. That's the cool thing. This manifold knows about this skeleton. And that skeleton is the thing I said before. That's what's called M0N trop. That itself has a functorial meaning or a, a, a modular meaning. This is the space of metrized graphs, tropical curves, metrized graphs. So this is very cool. What I'm saying is you take one of these metrized graphs you know, like say the one with one, two, three, four. There's only one uh, thing here, one invariant, that's this link. What I'm saying is the set of metrized graphs lives inside the, the analytification of M0N. That means this guy lives canonically. This is equal to, there's a canonical rational curve that this guy lives in as its, as its skeleton. So that the graph just has a, an analytic curve that it lives in. Um, I think that's kind of cool uh, and, and, not, and not deep. I mean, to, to prove this, this is easy. So that, that's just one example of this. Okay, at this point, I think we are getting close to being ready to, um, yeah, so now we're gonna take U to be log Kalabi Yao. 
I'll call it yell. And I need it to be what's called maximal boundary. Maximal boundary, that just means that the skeleton has the full dimension. Actually, Sean, can you go back uh, yeah. one slide and say that again? Uh, About M0N? Yeah, yeah, so you said inside the space of all the space of all trees are uh, yes. Really so, so okay, yeah, let's let's say it. So what's so M0N? You know, yeah. M0N. Um, I have a compact. I have a minimal compactification of M0N. M0N and M0N bar. That means I get a, a, a canonical subset of um, a canonical. You know, the, the support of a, a fan inside its analytification, and that is the thing that people study: the space of phylogenetic trees. Um, and what's called M0N trop. You know, it's the set of, or also the set of tropical curves um, in the sets. These graphs. But you give, but but you've given it. You've given it a better structure. Like that's usually just like a polyhedral stuff. You well, right. It, now it lives. It lives inside a manifold. Uh, well, a Burkhardt version of a manifold, and that manifold is a moduli space of of curves. So, so this 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 each point, every point. I'm saying this guy right there. Um, this this graph. Once you, get, you know this metrized graph. Associated to it canonically is a curve, and and such that this graph is the is the skeleton of that curve. So this tro the, the tropical space you know lives inside the 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 the, the trop. This is another example. The tropical thing actually lives in the Berkovich thing. Of course, also inside of here, then inside the analytification, we would have had m zero n you know the the k points. So we have sort of the, the algebraic geometry version and the uh, tropical version at, at the same time. Okay, so now back to the next page. Uh, now I want to, um, what's our goal? So now, I can, I, now I'm just about ready to tell you what the, the, how to do mirror symmetry in this world. So I, I start with a log Calabi Yau. I want it to have maximal boundary. That just means that, 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 there's, that in a minimal compactification, there, there are some zero strata. That means that there's, there's cones, maximal dimensional cones uh, that occur. Um, so as I have that. And then what's going to be my, my version of M is going to be S key is the integer points of the skeleton. That's going to replace the old M. It's M. That's the new, that, I, mean, that, I mean, that is M in the toric case. That's what M is. And so what I'm going to do is, just like before, I'm going to take A. That's just going to be, well, I'm going to have a ring R, which I'm not going to tell you about right away, just because I find it confuses people. And it's a totally simple thing. You'll just like it better if I introduce it later. So I've got this ring. Uh, and A is going to be the free R module with basis, the tropical set. So just formally, it's the direct sum over points in the trop in the in the skeleton here, these integer skeletal points of well R times a basis vector, and I'm going to call the basis vector theta p. <laughs> it's just a free module with this set uh, uh, as its basis, um, and uh, and. You can just think of for the for the moment we could just think of R as Z. It's not the right thing. You you actually can put a structure just with Z, but it's better to do something else. But for the moment, just play. Think of R as Z, and then we'll see later that oh, we should have done something slightly different. Um, so uh, great. And now the claim is that this is a ring. So this is naturally a ring. This is a ring, and the spectrum of this ring is going to be the is going to be what what the mirror, what mirror symmetry is. That's what the mirror to the Calabiao is going to be spectrum of this ring. So how do I make something like this a ring? Well, I just have to tell you, how do you multiply the basis elements? You know, I have to tell you, how, how am I going to multiply a bunch of basis elements? Well, whatever it is, it's going to be a sum, a unique expression as a sum of some coefficients, q, theta, q. You know, this is just, anytime you have a, a basis on, a, on an algebra, then you get these structure constants. So the whole thing is determined by structure constants they're living in R, but at the moment we can think of them as living in Z. So basically to make this into a ring, you give me a bunch of um, input uh, elements of this tropical set. Those are basically boundary divisors where, where our uh, volume form has a pole. And then you give me an, one more Q and I have to tell you what coefficient to put in front. Okay, so how are we gonna do that? Um, well, there's, it turns out a pretty nice definition. So I'm going to just give you. I want the best thing I think about our construction. This is sorry. This is joint work. This is all with Tony Yu. Is how elementary it is. Um, so I'm just going to give you the, the absolute on the nose legitimate definition, just because I want to show you that the actual definition is so simple. It will not. It may look a little weird, but it, but you will agree. I hope that it is completely elementary. And then if I have some time, I will try to motivate it a little bit. Okay. So how do I do this? 
Well, I have to study a nice moduli space. So let's say I, let's take a bunch of P1 up to a bunch of these guys in SKU. What does it mean? Well, I'm gonna write them as uh, each of these PIs as MI times DI, where this is primitive. You know, in other words, what, what, what were these things? They're, we just said, what all these guys are, they're a, they're a divisor in some compactification together with an integer multiplicity. That's just what they are. Suppose I have that thing. And let's say that all the, the PI, or let's say the DI, appear on the boundary of Y. So I have a, an SNC compactification and I have all these divisors there. If that's no big deal. If they're not there, they'll be on some toric, on some blow up, just blowing up the strata of this SNC compactification, they'll eventually appear. So there's, that's easy. They're, they'll all live in, in some compactification. So let's just, for convenience, say they're all there to start with. And now there's something you can count in the log Calabiao world. You can count rational curves. I'll draw a picture of what we're gonna count. So here's a, let's say we have something that looks like this. There's a picture of, you know, of four boundary divisors. We're gonna count rational curves. I'll draw them just, you know, like I've been doing, like P1s, like, like spheres. I'm gonna count rational curves that have ju just four points of contact with the boundary. They're, you know, the, 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 they only touch the boundary at these given boundary divisors and they, and they, and they touch with the multiplicity that's given by these MIs. And then to, to get a zero count, it has to pass also through, um, you, I'll also have to have one more mark point. So let me just give you the full definition, but this is all we're gonna do. Count rational curves touching with, 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 with you know, M mark points, touching the boundary with the given multiplicity. So what's ex explicitly what I'm taking is I take the moduli space M M, it depends on what? Well, P1 up to PM and Q. Um, oh no, sorry, at the moment it's just this one. Uh, then I'll, when I, when I, when I, th this is kind of independent of the, of, the, of the mirror algebra of defining those structure constants. This is, I can just say, let's look at this moduli space. What is it? Well, it's tuples. It, 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 it's, it's, it, it's, uh, um, it's first of all a, a curve with a bunch of points on it and then one more point and that should live in um, M0, M plus one, um, which I'm really gonna think of as the universal curve over, um, over M0, M. So it's just a, you know, it's just P1 with M points plus one more point. Um, that's that guy, plus a, a stable map, a map from C bar into Y, such that when I pull back the boundary, scheme theoretically, what I get are these points with the given multiplicities. Everybody cool? The, 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 I'm using the same symbol several times. I'm using, the, I'm using P, PI for the boundary divisor. That means the element of the, of the skeleton. But I'm also using PI for the point on the rational curve for good reason, because I'm saying, you know, why well, give them different names? I'm, here's PI, the boundary divisor as well. It's really MI times DI. And then I'm calling the point where it touches PI, little PI. Um, so that's that's what the, okay. So that's what the moduli space is. Everyone cool? You you have m plus one points. One of them is um, I, I don't I didn't say what happens to it, but all the other points, the ones I'm calling p, the, 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 those are the only places where this curve touches the boundary, that where the curve goes outside of u. So so I have this picture. Okay. Um, so you know by construction this comes with a map. Um, what can I do with this moduli space m? This uh, M, P1 up to PM. Well, by construction, it has a map to C0, the, the universal curve, that's over M0 and over M, the universal curve, cross U, just what? You know, just take all the data that I gave you, which was C bar and those PIs and this point Q and F, and send it to what? Well, C bar, the data, the domain, the domain curve, that's what C0N is, and then just evaluate at the last point. Okay, An easy deformation theory tells you that this map is generic, let's call this phi, this is generically a tau. What do I mean by that? I mean that if inside of here, if I threw away a, 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 in the target, if I threw away a lower dimensional Zariski closed set and restricted the map, it would be a finite a tau map. That's easy, like, I mean, it, it, it's easy to do the dimension count, but it's actually just easy to prove it's literally, that, that's literally true. Okay, and so now what do I do? Um, 
so now, and now let's, um, um, that's basically the thing we're going to, this is, this is, this is actually the space we're going to do, but we're going to study the analytification of this. So analytify, and the analytification has just exactly the same meaning. You know, what is it? It's just, you know, a bunch of, bunch of points on analytic P1. Uh, and what, what's this? It's space of maps, but it's, you know, because because these maps are maps of, of an analytified P1, the map itself is an algebraic map. So there's much, much going on. Um, so I, I have the same fee. But the thing that's funny is now I have a natural skeleton inside of here. So inside there, I have a natural skeleton. And what is it? Well, it's the skeleton of, of uh, C0n across the skeleton of U. Um, I'm gonna call that skeleton and I'm gonna be studying its inverse image inside of here. And at the end, if I have time, I'll, I'll tell you what's the meaning of this inverse image. That also has a nice meaning, just like I was bragging about how cool the skeleton of M0n is because it's like a tropical object and yet it lives in a, in a complex manifold, so to speak. This other, this phi inverse has a, sing, a similar property. So this is the picture I'm gonna look at. And, and the reason I got down to this was, so I told you that this, this algebraic geometry map was um, after throwing away a closed set, it's just a, it's a cover. It's a, a finite ATL cover. I should have told you before, the skeletons in all cases miss all Zariski closed sets. Well, lower dimensional Zariski closed, just because the skeleton only consisted of, of valuations on the generic point. So this good guy, SK, this guy here, this lives, the point is phi is a tau, phi is a cover around this SK. So what it means is I can count fibers. I can just naively count. I can naively count count fibers here. You see, it's a cover. It's you know, if I go to some field extension, it's just a truly a, just a bunch of discrete points. So in this world, I can I can uh, I can I can count the fibers of this map. Okay, so let's let's tell, let me let me tell you now what my structure constant is going to be. So what's the structure constant? So again, what are we given? We're given, let's say, p one and p two. Uh, and I want to multiply theta p1 times theta p2. That's supposed to be some sum of some coefficient, p1, p2, q, theta q. So I give you p1, p2, those are kind of the inputs, and q is kind of the output. Those are all these things, but I'm going to treat them in different ways. I'm going to think of the pi, they're all elements of the skeleton, but I'm thinking of the pi as, you know, boundary divisors. But Q, I'm going to think of as an honest point of the skeleton of, of U, which just lives inside of the analytification of U. So now I'm going to take a particular fiber. I'll take a fiber of that phi. What do I take? You know, take the fiber over some point of phi. So what am I going to take? Well, I have to give you a point in, um, I have to give you a point in the skeleton of, of uh, C0. How many do we have now? Uh, uh, um, well, it's sorry, I didn't tell you which one, what it's going to be. So, sorry, sorry, hold on one second. Sorry, let me, let me, I have to tell you, I have to tell you what, what are the, how do I apply the, the, the previous thing? So I need to, I need to assume something now. And if hopefully I'll have time to explain why we, why we'll be able to get rid of this assumption. Let's, let's, let, let's not need, let's just say assume, assume I have a torus living inside of you as an open set. It's a risky open set. There's millions of such examples, but that's not, most log clavios do not have a torus, but there's, you know, you can get rich just on the ones that, that do. Um, but there, uh, so suppose I have a Zariski open set. What's fun about that? Well, first of all, just from the very definition, the skeleton of U is can canonically equal to the skeleton of TM. So now this, this identifies my skeleton with a vector space. I wanna say this is not at all canonical. What happens in this world is if you have one torus in there, you almost always have infinitely many tori. And if you take a different identification, you'll get a different vector space structure on the same set. So the skeleton is not a vector space. It's a like piecewise linear object. Uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about straight in the skeleton. It makes sense to talk about piecewise straight. But anyway, we get this identification and I had a Q in here. Q was in, the was in M. Q was in the skeleton, which is now identified with M. So now I can talk about minus Q. Just, you know, 
think of this as an abelian group. Take that we're, we're doing toric geometry. Uh, for toric geometry, I have one point in the lattice. I there's you know I have its minus. You know they're kind of related. If you, if you took the 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 the, um, the 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 line as your fan spanned by both of them, you'd get a P1 bundle. So it's not a completely nuts thing to do to study minus Q. Okay, so now what, what is going to be my, how am I going to apply my, my construction? So what, what did I need? I needed a bunch of boundary divisors. My boundary divisors are going to be P1, P2, and this thing I'm calling minus Q. And then I have the auxiliary point is going to be Q. So I take the moduli space from before, P1, P2, minus Q. Um, that, you know, that has a map now to, in this case, what is it going to be? C0. I guess it's C03 uh, um, cross U analytic. And I have to give you a point in here to, and we said this is a this is a cover generically. I have to give you a point in here over which to take the fiber. What point should I take? Well, um, I don't have much here. The, the, I only have three points. So the, the, the this is the space of tropical curves. There's, there's only one, there's only one curve. And now I have to give you a point on it. I'm gonna take the point at distance one here. Call that little point Q. And then what am I going to take in U? I'll take in U the point Q as an element of the skeleton of U inside of um, uh, inside of U analytic. And so I take phi inverse of this particular point. That's some finite set. It's a finite set of stable maps. Stable maps, you know, of pointed rational curves, pointed rats into Y. But I'm not going to take all of them. So what, what can I say about these? I have, to, I have to do yet another maybe strange looking thing. So what's true about these rational curves? What, what's true about the rational curves? Well, they, they all live over this, over this um, um, they all live over this skeleton of M0N. That means that these, all these rational curves, they all come, they look kind of like, there's the P1. It's got three marked points on it. And inside of it, there's a canonical graph picked out. And because I have the graph, I can decompose this just as before into two. So this X, which is P1 analytic from before, it's decomposed into two disks. One of which has the P's in it. The other one has the weird point minus Q in it. And the, uh, it's not weird, it's just the extra point. And then Q actually lies on the way I set it up, Q lies on the boundary. So I, I have maps of P1 into the space, and I'm going to take a subset of those maps. Maybe it looks strange, but be, but so I take the subset, take the subset of the fiber, of the fiber, that subset of this bunch of maps, such that F of the disk at it, around minus Q lands in the torus, where star just means, star just means, you know, remove the point that I'm calling minus Q. You know, the picture looks like this. So, so these guys, what, what, what's the picture? What are the things I'm counting? Here's Q. Here's, here's the boundary divisor P1, P2. This is that divisor minus Q. I'm counting rational curves that touch here. They're, they're decomposed into two disks. This guy's on the boundary Q. And this lives inside the torus. This part with what, once you throw away that point, that lives in the torus. The point is this, you know, the, 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 let me go back. The, um, I was talking about a fiber of this map phi. And that's what I'm working on. This is an atal map. This, this fibers are just discrete. I, it, it's a, a perfectly nice set. I can take any subset of it I want. So I take that particular subset, I take its length, and that's the definition of the structure constant. Um, Maybe why did you take that subset? Yes, so I, I, if I, I have time, I'll, I'll explain why. So I had two motivations. One was to try to explain, you know, why do we do it? And, and the second was to convince you that, geez, this is awful elementary. So let me first just say this works. So the theorem is it works. I guess that's a good reason for taking that subset. Yeah, well, no, no, I'll explain it. You know, I mean, there's a reason we, we did it. So it works. What does it works mean? Okay, so the first statement is that A defined in this way. Oh, I should have said now, why did I lie? To make this count, you can't take the moduli space of rational curves, stable curves. You have to fix the class of the curve. So to make to make M, I have to fix 
the class beta, a, 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 the curve class, you know, like in Grom up Witten theory, you have to you have to fix the class of the curve. So all of this stuff really involved, I choose P1 up to PM, Q, and a beta. So, you know, take all the stuff I had before plus a curve class. And then I count, I count these rational curves in a given class. So so so, so the class so the class makes sense because you're just dealing with algebra. I mean, these are honest curves in something algebraic. So. Yeah, yeah, sure. They're big, yeah. I mean, they're just the analytification, the theory. There is a whole theory of cohomology of these spaces and stuff, but it's just equivalent when you analytify. So yeah, it's exactly the same theory. Um, so actually, where does the structure constant actually live? The, 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 what, what I should do is then my, my, my coefficient ring is really the monoid ring for the Mori cone. So when, when my ring is as an abelian group, what my A really is, it's the direct sum over, um, over all uh, Qs in the skeleton and all curve classes, beta in, in the Mori cone. You know, living in H2 of Y. And then what do you have? Well, now you have integers, you have a curve class, a formal monomial given by a curve class, and then a theta P, a theta Q, sorry. So it's, it's the only difference is to get an integer, I have to also specify the curve class. But that's not, now we see that that's more fun. So, so and, and the statement now is A is, A, so what, what does it mean? So A is a finitely generated R algebra. Note, and of course, the hard thing is associative. Associative commutative, the commutative is ob obvious, but finally generated associative R algebra. Um, uh, notice it's automatically flat. It's a free module. It's a, it's a flat. It's obviously flat. It's free. So I take, when I take spec of it, let's take spec of A. That maps to spec of R. I should have said, what is spec of the monoid ring of the Mori, you know, this monoid ring means it's the global functions on, on some affine toric variety. What's the affine toric variety? It's the toric variety given by the Neff cone of Y. That's just almost the definition. It just says that the Neff cone is dual to the Mori cone. So, so I've got this family, I'll call this family, um, you know, I just get this for free. Let's call this thing V. And now let's restrict in, inside of this toric variety, I have a torus, torus for the Picard group of Y. Let's restrict still call that pi here. And the theorem is that pi is a family of, of affine log Calabiaus of the same dimension as u. Now, conjecturally, this is the homological mirror symmetry mirror. But let me just say that in, in, in there's lots of examples, lots of, in the cluster case, if these are one example of such things are cluster varieties. In the cluster case, we know that they are equal, that we know what the mirror is. There's, there's already a mirror defined by, um, defined by uh, Goncharov, uh, um, Fock and Goncharov, the mirror to a, to a certain bunch of these U's. Um, and I'm not sure whether actually at this point, whether homological mirror symmetry is known, known that this is the homological mirror symmetry mirror. But certainly in lots of examples, it's known. There's lots of them that are related to Langland's program. Um, and we know that ours, and we know our mirror is equal to that. Our mirror is equal. Now you might say, who cares? Like for example, in dimension two, in dimension two, in fact, you itself, you'll get a family of surfaces and you itself will be one of the fibers. In dimension two mirror symmetry is your, your isomorphic to your mirror. Now you might say, Okay, I, I started with a variety. Um, it, it would happen to be some cluster variety. I, I do this, this weird construction. I produce a mirror and I get something that I already knew. So who cares? Well, notice what's true about this algebra A. It comes with a basis. So this mirror, this family of varieties that I produce on every fiber, I have a canonical basis of functions. And more than that, I have its multiplication rule given by counting rational curves. So you start with some object you already know, you run this machine and you endow it with a canonical basis of functions. So you get something really cool out of this. Okay, let's see, I got about six minutes. Let me explain a little bit, um, why do I do this weird thing? Why this weird thing? 
so of all, your, of all the weird things you do, yeah. which weird thing yeah. are you talking about? Oh, what, so why did I take this particular subset of the fiber of this map? Oh, great. And also maybe why am I even looking at this map at all? So let's go back to the very beginning. We started with M, right? M was a, you know, was, was a, the co it was a free abelian group. It was the co-characters of some Taurus. Um, and, uh, and, and our U was TM. And we formed the mirror algebra. In that case, it's easy. The mirror algebra is just Z, ZM. Um, but, but, you know, you know, what does that mean? In this world, how do you multiply? What's theta P times theta Q? or P1 times theta P2, it's theta P1 plus P2, or you just add, I mean, it's, it's a group, so you can just add. So the problem is that, that the, the skeleton, that's these bunch of valuations, this is not a group. Um, the skeleton of U, you know, R, let's, uh, the, this part, this, this is not a vector space. So it's hard to do this. It doesn't have a linear structure. But it does inherit something. So let's, let's still talk about the, the toric case, MR. So just R, let's say R2. In R2, I, I have a linear structure. I can talk about balanced tropical curves. You know, you have a graph inside of R2. You know what it means for it to be balanced. These directions add up to zero. That's, you know, you know that because you know how to add. Okay. Well, now let me tell you what was cool about this skeleton in M. So let's go back to my M. Remember what M was? It was, it was stable maps. Uh, here it was going to say some C0M cross U inside of here by analytic. So th these, were, these were these rational curves. These are rational curve, you know, pointed rational curves. These are pointed rational curves mapping into Y, into this compactification. These are rational curves. Here I'll draw the, I won't draw the uh, S2 picture, just draw kind of like normal algebra geometers do. Got, you got rational curves touching the boundary at the given boundary divisors. Yeah, this map. Inside of here, we had this a skeleton, which was uh, C zero n trop, the tropical, the universal tropical curve across the skeleton of U. That's like think of that as being like R n. It's actually always a Q homology R n. And then uh, this was called the skeleton. And then I have the inverse image of that, the inverse of the skeleton, which I just call the inverse I S K. And let me tell you what's the meaning of I S K, which is completely cool. So what's so all these things? What are they? All these things are, you've got some rational curve with some points on it, mapping into, into Y. Here's a picture of Y with D. You have some rational curves mapping in here and they only touch at the boundary. You know, you only, you, the, only, the, 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 only place you, the only place you touch the boundary is at these marked points. Inside of here, we have the skeleton of U, which is like R2. In dimension two, it's homeomorphic to R2. Inside of here, I have a canonical metrized graph. And here I have an analytic map. Now, what would you wish to be true? Maybe somebody just tell me what would be nice in this picture. So here I have an analytic curve mapping into a complex manifold kind of thing. Inside the curve, I have this graph. Inside the, the, the manifold, U, I have this R2. What would be nice? So you want to send that, you want to send the curve into that. Plane. Yes, wouldn't it be nice if the curve landed inside of the thing? That's exactly what, what, what this inverse image, that's essentially equivalent. So F being in ISK is essentially equivalent to that, that, that the graph lands in the graph. Um, so why is this cool? These things, these, these particular stable maps come with a tropicalization. That doesn't use any of the things that usually you have in tropicalization. There's no notion of balancing here. There's no balancing condition. They're just particularly cool analytic maps. And now I can say, so now I can say what it means if I take a, a metrized graph and a continuous map into the skeleton. I'll say it's balanced if, well, if it comes this way. If it's if it's the tropicalization of you know of a map, if there's if it comes from an analytic curve, um, in the in the Torah case, this is just the same as the original balance condition. So now suddenly I know in SKU. So for example, I can do it just with two points. Just do it with two points. Then I then this guy's mapping into you know 
this guy with two boundary divisors. Now what's the now now the skeleton is just a just a long interval mapping into my R two here, and now I, I I get I get some you know it doesn't make sense to talk about straight, but I can just say this is this is quote straight. I can say that this that this object which doesn't have any linear structure I I know what piecewise straight paths mean, but I can say those I can call them straight or nice if they are actually the skeleton of an analytic curve, and now I'm getting close to being able to you know, add in this world. Um, so uh, what was the meaning? I won't probably go through the whole thing. What was the meaning I had? I had the condition. I had a weird condition on my map. My domain was broken into two parts. And I asked that the down here was kind of auxiliary. I asked that the bottom disk map into the torus. What, what, what's the meaning of that? Well, in the toric case, the toric case, I you know, I have MR sitting in here. I know what straight means. And in the toric case, anything that maps into the torus, it you know, it, it's the, the skeleton is actually straight. So what this means is this analytic condition was a way of saying, I want the tail down here to be straight. Maybe I'll just let it go though. Just go with that. Um, okay. The uh, um, the um, well, let me just say, let me go to the next page. I'll give you one more bit of jive here. Um, you know, what does it mean that P1 plus P2 equals Q in M? It means that, that I can draw um, a balanced tropical curve that looks like this, which in this direction goes off to infinity in the direction P1. In this one, it goes off in the direction of P2. And here at the point Q, there's a distinguished direction minus Q. The, the fact that Q equals P1 plus P2 means there exists a balanced tropical curve that looks like this. Well, now I've generalized that. So now I can phrase that, that condition um, you know, without having a vector space. That's kind of what this did. All right, good enough. So good enough means that's, that's ready for lots of questions? Yeah, sure, whatever you got. Excellent. Good. Okay. Good. Great. Let's. Uh, uh, oh, maybe my first question is: presumably, all your slides are not going to be lost because they're they're kind of spread about over many notebooks on your iPad. Uh, well, I've never. I have to say, I've never downloaded or used this notebook thing except for these talks. Probably, oh. I could figure. Probably, I could figure out how to do it. So essentially, all the, all I, the notebooks. You could basically just give us all the notebooks since they're only the ones that really. Do. Yeah. Let's just not uh, forget about the notes. I mean, you'll have this thing recorded, right? It, bad as it is. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, well, I guess, uh, I, yeah. yeah, okay. I think the notes will be out faster than, okay, we'll have to arm wrestle to see which comes out first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think the slides will be very useful. Um, um, I'll try. Maybe give me your iPad and then I'll figure it out from there. Yeah, that's what we'll do. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it outside my door. <laughs> All right. Great. So uh, great. So, uh, well, let me ask you, Robbie, because you're the yeah. one talking to me. Um, did you have any idea what I was talking about? Yeah, I did. Well, uh, in the course of uh, uh, in the course of your talk, I think it's possible we're going to make this like the topic of a topic course next quarter at Stanford. So maybe if you'll, uh, I, I, that's why your notes will be very helpful because this was very interesting. So okay. So, uh, but uh, great. But questions from the audience. Now. 